Hey, good morning, everybody. How we doing? Three of you felt really good. The rest of you are just crowd support, so that was great. Uh, hey, uh, we just wanted to uh, announce uh, that last week uh, we finalized a few months process of uh, bringing on a new pastor here at Moraine Valley Church. So uh, Dikron Kundekian uh, is, uh, as of last Sunday, is our Next Steps pastor here at Moraine Valley. And so, um, and so really just uh, to, to, uh, to, to reiterate and bring up again from last week, uh, really Dickron's going to help us with everything from, uh, uh, <laughs> many of you have had this story, is coming in and trying to figure out how do I get connected, how do I get involved, where do I find the groups, how do I plug in, what ministries are available, and how do I get connected to some of these things. And that's not just for new people. Sometimes you've been here for 20 years and you're trying to figure out, I'd like to figure some of those things out too. Uh, Dickron will be walking uh, us through that and building things. Be patient. It won't be done on day one. Uh, it'll take some time. Uh, but also there's, there's uh, shepherding and pastoral care uh, responsibilities that Dick Ron will have in, in walking through some of that, as well as if you've ever known anyone in ministry, there's just the utility player role that everyone plays uh, that's in there too. So, uh, so we're really excited to have uh, Dick Ron with us, excited for uh, the ministry uh, that he will have here at Marine Valley Church. And so we just want to take a minute uh, to uh, just to pray uh, over him uh, a blessing. I say that as someone who just forgot the microphone, so let me go do that real quick. I had one job. I just did my one job. Okay, I'm gonna ask Ron, who's our, uh, the chairman of our elder team, would you pray over Dick Ron? Fellas, could we just put hands on? Father, what a great and awesome God you are. Your word tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be added to you. We, uh, we're in awesome wonder as we see the Holy Spirit fill this room and move in our lives, Lord. We're grateful that you brought Dick, Ron, and Jill to our congregation. That they attended that member class in November. And now Dick, Ron is stepping up to be part of our staff. Lord, we pray for an anointing on his ministry that it would yield a hundredfold with each life that he touches, walking closer with you, Lord Jesus, for spiritual growth and all for your glory. All God's people agreed and said, Okay, I lied. I have, I have another thing that I have to do today. It's, we're we're going to go through the Bible. Um, so, uh, hey, um, uh, one, one last uh, announcement, and this is really just excitement. I know uh, for a lot of you uh, who have been around Moraine Valley Church for a while, the name Word Partners uh, is not a surprise to you. You've heard that. You know that. Uh, some of you were around when it launched way back uh, two names ago when it wasn't Word Partners. I think Personal Ministries, is that the right name? Right, uh, and then uh, leadership resources, uh, and now word partners. And so, uh, if you've been around for, I want to say, forty-five years, fifty maybe, uh, fifty, sixty. Okay, um, if you've been around for what we, uh, as a as a church, uh, we have. Uh, not only from within uh, Moraine Valley with, with uh, Bill and Karen Mills, but uh, a lot of people who currently serve and are in those kind of capacities. We're Partners has uh, been a, a ministry that's launched in a lot of ways out of Moraine uh, and, and in a lot of ways too has continued to sustain through Moraine, uh, with a lot of you who give individually to different people. Uh, we have staff from uh, Word Partners that are uh, at church here uh, who attend and are members, uh, and people who ha have been here but are all over the world now uh, doing ministry uh, through Word Partners International, who really, uh, to, to the best of my understanding, and, and I've been in enough meetings I think I've got, uh, is it really exists to train pastors around the world who may not have access to Bible education on how to read the Word correctly and how to preach it uh, rightly. And so in that ministry, uh, they have, if you drive out the Ridgeland, uh, the, the little road that goes out here to Ridgeland, you'll see there's a Chase Bank on the left and then there's a building on the right. That's what that building is. 
Uh, and so next week, we're excited because for, uh, for years, we've had people that come in and share about uh, Word Partners and what they've done. And next week, we get uh, the blessing of uh, the executive director for Word Partners. Uh, Jeff Brewer is going to be with us sharing a word and really just spending a, a, a Sunday focused on who they are and what they're doing. And they have a really incredible announcement for us uh, that'll be exciting to hear and be a part of that. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, it's uh, anytime we get to uh, shine a spotlight on some of our uh, global partners and people doing ministries that we get to be attached to is a really powerful moment to understand uh, where, uh, you know, even, even things like what, when I give, what happens? And uh, 10% of everything we give goes to uh, global missions. And so we want you to see what some of that is doing and what that looks like. And so if you've never heard of Word Partners before, next week will be great. Uh, if, uh, if you were there when they signed the document naming it Word Partners, you're gonna love it too. So uh, we wanna make sure uh, that you are looking forward to that. So let me pray, and then I'm gonna jump into the Word here, and we will go. Fathers, we enter into this time. Uh, Lord, we ask that, um, that it would be consecrated as holy, uh, not just this time, but from the time uh, we started gathering corporately together this morning, uh, that everything from our worship and prayer uh, to uh, shaking hands and giving hugs and catching up, uh, praying with each other uh, in areas like the atrium and uh, here in, in this worship center. Uh, Father, as we open up your word, let this be a, a time uh, where you continue to speak uh, in this breathing, active word that you have for us. Uh, Father, as Jesus taught these words uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, Father, would we be reminded how timeless this message really is uh, and how little humans have really changed uh, because we still need this as much as what we've ever needed it and the world around us needs us to need this as much as it ever has. Uh, so Father, would you impart this on our hearts and ingrain it in our souls uh, so that it can uh, work its way out of our lives into the people that are around us and the life that we live. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have, for uh, a couple months now, been working our way through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And in this, uh, there's been different moments and different uh, places. We really took our time working through the Beatitudes. Uh, 12, 12 verses in the Bible took us eight weeks, so we should be done with the sermon somewhere around 2027. Uh, no, but... Um, but, but we uh, really, to slowly kind of work through and think through the power and the weight of, of the phrases, the words, the intent and the meaning, uh, the implications for our life that's meant. Uh, and, and we've been asking this question all along, do we think Jesus was serious? Uh, when he said this, was he just spitballing and coming up with some fun ideas? Or do we really think that in his 33 some odd years on earth that every word he spoke had intentionality for it, uh, that, that there was reason behind it and that we needed it, not just the moment it was spoken, but every moment since until he returns. And so as we've worked through this, we've talked through, if you uh, just gaze your eyes over Matthew chapter five, verses uh, one, technically I guess it, it probably kicks off more in three, the actual message but 3 through 12, we work through what we call the Beatitudes, which is kind of a weird linguistic way to get to the idea of the blessings. Here are the people that live a blessed life, or as we've articulated, because there's nuances in the original languages, as the good life or the flourishing life, painting a picture of this is what it looks like to really live into God's good life for his kingdom. And as we work through that, uh, we found that at the end of that, uh, there's a kind of life that is almost inevitable for people who live this way. Because then Jesus, at the end of that list, as he goes through, blessed are you who are poor in spirit, and blessed are you who mourn, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. As he goes through, then he gets to that part where he says, and blessed are you when people persecute you for righteousness sake. And it's like, well, that doesn't feel like a blessing, right? Uh, and then he says, blessed are you when people insult you and say all kinds of lies against you. Now, that's not lies because we live in the world and people just don't like you. It's because you're so living out your faith and walking in step with the Spirit and emulating your life to match as close as we humanly can the life of Christ that when we do that, that there's a separation between us and the world that takes place and the world revolts against it. Right? We see it clearly on the cross. Jesus dying for the people who he's asking, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. It's a way that we still act how we're supposed to act despite how people treat us back. 
that, that there is a way. I've loved this form. Uh, I remember reading it in Bible college, this idea of cruciformity. That as we form our lives into the life of Christ, or as rather as the Spirit is forming us into more Christ-likeness, it's not just to be like the Jesus who you know, sits around with the kids and says, you old people, be quiet. These are the ones who your faith needs to be like and the stories we love and the miracles, but also to be formed in the kind of life of Christ that we see crucified, hanging on a cross. And not just that he went there or that we're physically expected that we will, but the idea of who he was while he was up there, still praying for the people next to him, still blessing and praying over the people who just nailed him there. And in this, we learn, and Jesus is shaping in us this identity of this good life, these beatitudes. And, and again, as we went through, we learned that it will lead to people ridiculing and harm and lying about you. And when it happens, remember that you're still called to be the salt and the light. That despite how people react, because you've continued to pursue the life of Christ, that when that comes back, and when people treat you poorly, and when things happen in ways that you think, but God, I thought you said, if I did everything right, that this wouldn't happen to me. And then you realize, well, show me that verse. Because that's not in there. Jesus paints a very clear picture. You will be persecuted. Hard times will come. But he also says, take heart, because I've overcome the world. So it's not that bad things won't happen, struggles won't come, trials won't come our way. If anything, Jesus is promising you that it in fact will. But as it is, we lead towards a victory that's already been won. We have hope because there's been resurrection and we know that there's going to be a return. And so in this, as we've been reading through, uh, what my hope is, is as we get to uh, the salt and the light in Matthew chapter 5, this isn't just kind of a next chapter in the story. Uh, it is uh, almost in some ways kind of a final stamp on what's already been said. But probably more importantly, it's where you round that corner into the rest of the sermon. It takes everything from these Beatitudes as, and as we live into this good life persecution and hard times, people will lie and they will come against you. But in the middle of all that, you are still going to be the salt to the earth that's coming against you. You will still be a light to the darkness that surrounds you. So would you stand as we read the word of the Lord in Matthew chapter five? I'm going to read 13 through 16. Jesus taught this way. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Uh, Lord, as we open this, Father, what we're asking is that you uh, would, would remind us of the identity that you've called us into. Father, that we would be reminded how separated we've become from the old dead life that we used to live and the dead world that's around us. But Father, with a call to go back in, uh, that our job is not to retreat and hang out in safe places, uh, but it's to run back into the darkness because not only have we seen the light, but we've become it and we have it to shine. Uh, so Lord, would we own this identity? Would you uh, mess with us wherever we need mess with uh, for, uh, for us to truly see who you've called us to be, uh, to come out of maybe our insecurities that think maybe we can't get there, uh, or maybe our pride uh, to be reminded that uh, we're not light because of us, uh, that it's purely because of you. So Lord, would you shape this and mold it into our lives so that it comes out of who we are? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. Last week we talked about the salt, what it means to be the salt of the earth, and the question kind of becomes this, how are you salting, right? Uh, what, what, what are you salting? How did you salt this week? These are good ways to think about it. I want us to look at this week, how do, we, how do we light up the places around us? 
And being reminded, you are not the source of the light, you just are it. Uh, and, and through this, we'll read, Jesus claims that he is the light, and we know that our, the only way that we can be is because he is, and our connection to him, the further we go away from him, the l- dimmer our light gets, uh, because on our own, we're not that great, amen? All right, if you don't know that, keep hanging on, you'll get there, right? But in the same tone, I think in in all of this, we need to be reminded that this is a divine calling from Jesus. And if you don't agree with it, you can argue with Jesus. He's the one who said it. And we're reminded as we've gone through the Beatitudes that this kind of life will cause some to persecute you, but you are called to love and serve those who persecute you. You are still called to be light in those dark places. In fact, you are to continue remembering that your role is to salt and illuminate the world around us despite how they react or they respond. I want us to look through this in a couple sections and the first one's really just looking at the identity part. So I want us to think about this, that we need to take hold of our illuminated identity in Christ. That there is a beacon that we are called to be. I remember uh, in college having a professor that gave this imagery, and I don't think I'd heard it up until that point, this idea that, hey, wherever you move, wherever you go, your neighborhood will have a lighthouse for the kingdom because you live there. Your workplace will have a lighthouse for the kingdom because you work there. Your friend group will always have a lighthouse because you're there. Your family will have light because You're there, and that light will always lead people not to you, but to God. They will see through you to see him. And the question becomes, have we lost our identity? Or have we not owned the part of it that Jesus commissioned to us to own? One of our biggest issues we face in our Jesus-following life is not are we doing enough, but have we grasped the identity of who we are in Christ? Have we taken hold of who we are? Do we really believe that we are immensely loved by God? Do we love him back? Do we really believe that we have these missional identities and tasks of being salt and light? Do we really believe that with Jesus as Lord over our life, that we have surrendered everything to him? And when we find something we haven't, Are we quick to get it back to the cross because we don't want that uh, stinking up our life? It's not just what we do, but it's who we are. Matthew chapter five, verse 14, Jesus starts with, you are the light of the world. And we've talked about this because in our English language, we miss some of it, right? You are the light of the world. That's you plural. So if you're from the South, it's all y'all. Right? Again, if you're from God's country in Chicago, we would say it's you guys. All right? I don't know if Jesus would have said it this way, but I like the idea that he might have. You guys are the light of the world. All y'all. But he's not talking to the world at large. Remember, if you were to go back to the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus sits down with his disciples to teach them. Uh, These are the ones who have already left everything to come follow him. Uh, These are the ones who have abandoned the life that they had before to pursue a life with Jesus, that he would be their rabbi, that he would be their teacher, that they would uh, leave everything just to relationally spend time and be molded to be with him, uh, to, to shape their life to become like him so that they might go and do what Jesus does. And it's to those people that Jesus says, Use guys. Now it does say that there were other people listening, but Jesus isn't teaching necessarily to other people listening. My guess is it's the teaching version of like peripheral vision. They're there, they're hearing it, they're catching it, but it's for these people. Use guys. It's for the disciples. It's for those of us in this room who've surrendered our life to take hold of the life which Christ gave to us. And in this, we find that we do, in fact, have an identity. Show of hands, have you noticed darkness in the world around us? Anyone? Okay, those of you that did not raise your hand, let's talk afterwards. I got some examples, right? (laughs) Have you seen sin capturing and wrecking people's lives? Have you seen people isolated and bound by their guilt and their shame? Almost paralyzed. 
Have you seen people acting out of their own passions and desires, thinking they're advancing, but you watch them fall backwards? Have you noticed how dark the world is? Where are the places and situations where you've experienced the absence of God in the world around you? Think of the places where you wonder, God, I know you're everywhere. I just can't believe that you would be in this situation. I don't know how you're present here. Now, I'm not questioning whether or not he is. I'm just saying I've been in moments where I'm asking. In Isaiah's prophecy, he leads into the coming of the Messiah this way in Isaiah chapter 9. We, we like the part further down. We read it almost every Christmas where it's, you know, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So we're, we're, we're in the context of the, the Messiah's coming. But to launch all of that in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2, he starts his Christmas story. If we could phrase it that way, he wouldn't have. But if we could phrase it this way, he says this, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Painting the image that we all know too well, darkness just exists. It's around and it's there. And when the Messiah comes, it's bringing light into the darkness that exists. Darkness is real and it's here, but light is coming. For 600 more years or so, people were waiting in darkness for that light. Then John gives us his version of Jesus entering into our world with these words. In John chapter 1 verse 5, says, In him, meaning Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. That when Jesus showed up, he didn't show up when people finally got their act together. Thank God, we'd still be waiting. He didn't wait until everyone had it figured out, or until everyone was good enough, or everything was the way everyone liked, or voted the way everyone liked, or looked the way everyone liked, until everyone was just like you, right? Jesus didn't wait for that, because that's part of the problem. We all are waiting for the world to act just like us, because we think we've got it together. Jesus reminds us none of us do. And in this, we're reminded that the world is full of dead people looking for life and dead things. And for all of us, that's been our testimony. We've been there. We've done that. Trying to figure out how to make life happen when all there is is death and all we're chasing is what is death, but it's marketed and wrapped with a different label. So we think we're getting life. Until that relationship cracks or the substance no longer does what you want it to or you realize that none of it works and it's all just as broken as when you started. Jesus comes into the world and he brought the fullness of life with him. The life he brings was the light that this dark world was needing. Jesus showed up and shined out into the darkness of the world. And unlike every other attempt of dead people looking for dead things, Jesus actually brings life. And no one extinguished the life he brings. It is eternal and it's enduring. It keeps going and it doesn't slow down. Jesus later declares in John chapter 8 verse 12. It says Jesus again spoke to them saying I am the light of the world. And one who follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. And I remember having these arguments. Well which one's true? as though the Bible's going to contradict itself? The answer is yes. Jesus is the light of the world. And yes, Jesus said, so are you, so long as you're in him. Jesus is the light of the world. And if we follow Jesus, we will not walk in darkness, but we will have the light of life. Like following a torchbearer through the jungle at night, the closer you stay to the light, the better you can see the further you are away from the torch, the more of a struggle you're going to have. If you want to know where you're going and what's really happening around you so you can see with clarity what used to be dark, all you have to do is bring light into it and you can see everything for what it is. Amen? So when Jesus shows up at light, he gives us a true image of what deception can do in the dark. So long as it's dark, it is Satan's playground. The minute Jesus shows up with a light, all of a sudden we see, man, this thing we've been tripping over may not have been someone else's fault. Maybe I'm the goofball. Maybe there's things that's real around here that I didn't see before. Jesus is the light of the world. Our nearness to him determines 
the light we walk in. We are only light because Jesus is the light. And we are found in him. Now, don't forget our testimony. Uh, Paul summarizes it many ways, but this way in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He doesn't say you used to have darkness or be in darkness. He said your identity was darkness. Who you were was darkness. But now who you are is what? And what's the qualifying phrase there? In the Lord. You are light in the Lord. Out of the Lord, not light. In the Lord, this is getting good, all right? You following? So think about Tuesday or Wednesday or when you come home or when you show up to work or whether you're making the decision whether the snooze button's the better ministry, right? Is as we step into places and we walk in, in the Lord, there's light. But you know, because you've walked into days where it's not been as in the Lord as others. And there's been darkness. I had a mentor who always gave the phrase, and he said, I don't think the Bible anywhere uh, instructs you to wake up early before everybody and read the Bible. But what I know is the first person I encounter, if it hasn't been Jesus, isn't going to get a good version of me. That if I spend time with God first, what I've got to give the rest of my day is light. Why? Because I've placed myself at the beginning of my day to be in the Lord. So that as I walk into my workplace, what they get is the dawn in the Lord, not the dawn out of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It isn't just about what you did. It's about who you were. You were darkness, but now you are light. Not because you figured it out or learned more or because you worked through your bad patterns or habits. You are now light because you are in the Lord. And he says, so then live as children of light. Live that way. Walk in that way. Know that your new birth into a living hope has a heavenly father and you are a child of his and you walk as children of the light. You're only, the only identity you've got in this new creation is to be light. So be it. And walk in it. And enjoy it. The question then becomes, why don't we? What is it that happens between reading verses like this and having that like, yeah. And like tomorrow morning. But what are the things that kind of tamper the light? That dim it down a little bit? What are, what are the, the moments? What are the things? What is it inside of us that has to constantly put fresh oil in? That has to constantly bring ourselves before the Lord. That has to constantly require the renewal without quenching of the Spirit. Matthew chapter 5, 14, it says, you are the light of the world. We are the light of the world because we are in Christ who is the light. And this isn't just for preachers or professors or missionaries or martyrs. It's Jesus speaking to his disciples. That's all of us. This isn't just a, oh, well, yeah, if you're going to like move to, you know, name your country that's not here there, that's probably where you're going to be the light. No, it's your neighborhood and it's your workplace and it's your family. You, you are the light. And the next thing I want us to think about is this. If you have placed your allegiant trust in King Jesus, you are the light of the world. So live as children of the light. And as we keep going through this teaching, we end up here. Jesus' disciples are a faithful, visible community. Faithful, visible community. Uh, one of my favorite people to read is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he's just been one of those people for me that I, I, I read and reread his books. And he, his book called Cost of Discipleship is uh, over the Sermon on the Mount. And in this book, uh, he talks about this phrase as the, or sorry, this section of the Sermon on the Mount as the visible community. And the reminder is this, it's Jesus saying, you need to be in a way to where the world can see you, but not just for the sake of seeing you so that they can see me through you. That there's a visibility. What he means is you can't be, uh, it's a paradox in all of scripture to think that you could have a private faith without a public witness. 
Jesus continues to teach. We see what we are called to be. Matthew chapter 5, 14, he says this, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, I remember uh, I, I did a summer internship in Phoenix. And so if you know anything about geography, a long drive from central Illinois, where I was from. Uh, and so on the way out, uh, we drove through Albuquerque, New Mexico. Anybody driven through Albuquerque? All right. Uh, we got through there. It was in the middle of the night. Uh, and it was uh, myself and Ray's brother, uh, and we're driving in a truck that was not fit to go over 55, but we were going well over the speed limit. Uh, Jesus is still doing a work and continues to this day, all right? So don't judge me. I'm on a journey. We were flying through, and I remember rounding the corner in Albuquerque, and if you've ever, New Mexico isn't exactly like bustling with activity, right? Uh, and so as we're rounding the corner, uh, it was uh, like we, we came up, and I don't, I, in my mind, we came up, and like Albuquerque was, the way we came in was just set up on this hill. And all of a sudden, there was just this glow, and there was life, and there were people, and there were things happening. In the middle of the desert, there was a city on a hill. Uh, in Jesus' original audience, they would have known their own city on a hill. Jerusalem was a city built on a hill. It would have been illuminated. It would have been that one where if you're far away from 30 miles, you could probably see the lights hitting the clouds kind of deal. There's people there. There's light that's there. And when, you're, when it's dark all around, you know where the city's at. He says, church, as a disciple community, we are a city on a hill. In a valley, you may not see it, but on a hill, especially at night, you can't miss it. Jesus is moving our attention from our identity to the public witness of what we believe. Our identity and our new creation cannot be hidden. Verse 15, he says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And with salt last week, uh, we talked about, uh, we didn't talk, Jesus talked about it, we just talked about what Jesus talked about. And he said, if the salt loses its saltiness, people will throw out the unusable salt. He doesn't say God throws out the unusable salt. God still loves you. You're good. But it just says, what use are you to the people around you if you're not who God's called you to be as light and dark places? Because you're not one of them and you don't really look like you're one of his. So what good is it? And we get here to this light imagery and we find we're questioning what could it, could it be if someone lit a lamp and then covered it up? My guess is when uh, your house was built is the contractor didn't come in looking for which corner of the floor to put your light fixtures in, right? Uh, when we bought our house, I don't know if, it, you know, some of it's just time. Uh, a lot of our bedrooms did not have like lights up. They were built for like light switches with lamps kind of deal. Right, And we just thought, I, I wouldn't say we, Ray's smarter than I, I thought, right? Well, they must have just messed this up. And I didn't realize the plan was for different kind of lamps. But, but what do we know, right? When we put lights in our house, or I don't know, let's say our worship centers, where do the lights go? Up. Because when the light's up, it illuminates everything. And the same thing's true with our life, but oftentimes we, like the people Jesus is talking to and giving a warning to that we need to heed thousands of years later, that we as light can often hide ourselves under baskets or bowls or cushions or blankets or whatever it takes just to get away, to retreat and to hide because to be like that feels like a lot and just to be over here feels like what I need question becomes this. If Jesus died and rescued me, then why do we spend so much time covering up our new life? If, if really we were as lost as what scripture says we were, and my own story would be that that's true. And Jesus redeemed us with a mighty hand in a way that only he could. And we were able to die to our old way of life. And through Christ, we were able to rise and walk in this new life with him. If that is true, and we have that kind of freedom and that kind of peace, and we have that kind of hope set before us, then why do we spend so much time on this end of the grave, if you will, covering up the work that Christ is trying to do or doing? As I was sitting in this teaching this week, the idea of hiding our light reminded me of Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes. Guilt and shame led them to hide from God. Is it possible that that shame is still the reason we're hiding, that Satan and his ability to deceive and accuse still brings up old stuff that's been put to death and makes you feel like that impending thing is still laying on your shoulder. 
and that you in a new life could still be suffering under the weight of the old life that's already been paid for, had victory over, covered over, and you're good. But Satan, because he's good at what he does, knows how to get it. So it's still just kind of lurching on your back. That same pride that's supposed to be in the grave is like on a chain that you're dragging that dead body with you everywhere. And the same insecurity and the same issues, the same addictions, the same struggles that you had when you buried your old life with Christ. Some of that stuff keeps coming back. And it's ridiculous to think that you would light a lamp just to put it under a basket to either diminish the light or extinguish it altogether. And the question for us becomes, how do we start making sure that the light that we are gets uncovered and put in a place where it can be used. Mark chapter 8 verse 38. Jesus says this. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. The son of man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. It doesn't make sense to surrender to the lordship of a saving king. To be redeemed and restored uh, out of our sin and into freedom. Only to hide in some sense of shame to the world around us. We have been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection from the dead. And we want to throw a basket over on top of that? Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this. Flight to the invisible is a denial of the call. As we run into the dark shadows, we're just walking away from who God's called us to be. When we go hide and throw a basket over who we are, we're walking away from our calling. Uh, when our instinct is to retreat and be away, to, uh, uh, to, to insulate and isolate, we're walking away from our calling. He goes on to say this, a community of Jesus which seeks to hide itself has ceased to follow him. Paul later writes in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is there to be ashamed of, church, when Jesus' good news is the power of God for salvation? If you've been saved by Jesus, and if that's true, wouldn't you want others to see and hear what God has done in your life? Have you ever run into people who knew you before, like your BC days? Right? And they, they, they were a part of some nefarious activities in your life story. You know what I'm talking about? And you talk to, I, I've had this, right? And uh, one of my favorites was, I remember uh, in, uh, probably five, six years ago, we were doing a Friday night worship night. And, uh, and, and we had this guy who was bigger than me, uh, which I'm not the largest person, but I'm also not the smallest. Uh, so he was this looming figure and like blubbering at the altar. And I mean like, like big baby tear type stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like the blah, 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 like the ugly, like you could hear it over the drums kind of crying, right? Uh, and and I re- like, so then afterwards, like, you know, he like cleans himself up, which took a little bit of work. Um, and afterwards, you know, I was like, man, what, what was God doing there? Right. What was happening? And all he said was, all I could think of is last year at this time on Friday nights, he's like, I, I, I was rolling things and sticking needles and I'm at church worshiping. I was darkness, but now I'm light. First John chapter one, verse five, he says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him, there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, read it church. We, and we do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Walking in hiding, shame, secrets, guilt, sin, it's only killing you more. Walk in the light with Jesus. Walk in fellowship with each other. Jesus cleansing us from all sin. Some of us, or people we love, are walking in darkness. Come be in the light. As Jesus is in the light, we don't have to become something we are not. We just have to give public witness to our new creation, which has been made in King Jesus. All you've got to do is be who you truly are. Most of our life, and this is part of that darkness, was spent becoming something we weren't. 
and trying to be something we couldn't be and shaping whatever we could to try to put on some posture and fool people into thinking we were great. And church, can we readily admit that didn't work? But now we find who we really are and all we have to do is just be that. And how many of you can give testimony? It's not the easiest task because there's some kind of magnetic draw, we'll call it evil, that pulls us back to the old life. Paul regularly gives his language, take off the old self and put on the new, almost like it's clothes we've got to change daily because we keep wanting to put back on the old nasty stuff. We just have to be faithful to who we truly are in Jesus. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither can our lives. We need to shine, not diminish what God has done in our lives to the people around us. The dark world around us doesn't need a church that's hiding under a bowl or covered up in a blanket. Last one's this, your light must shine in front of other people. And those aren't my words, Jesus said that. I was actually trying to come up with some crafty way to think through how to name this sermon point. And I thought, you know what? Jesus is a pretty good preacher. We're going to go with what he said. Your light must shine in front of other people. Not if you're extroverted and you like to just, you know, be around the buzz. This isn't the, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're like the person who likes to stay at the very end and shake everyone's hand, hi, my name's Don and I'm a witness, right? This isn't just if you're outgoing. No, it is for every believer that you must shine light in front of other people. That there is a public witness to your private faith. And I would even say you don't have a private faith. Here's a command from Jesus that your private walk, meaning your walk away from the world in the interior world, inside your soul, in that prayer closet, when you are not out there, but when you're just with him, it's in that abiding place. That when you're in there, that has to come out somewhere. Read through Acts and find all the places. And we, I've, I've seen people try to recreate these moments in the book of Acts where everyone gets in the room and they start praying and then the room starts shaking and the doors break open. And they think, man, if we could just have a prayer moment like that. And what we forget was out of that prayer moment came one of the massive missionary expansions of the Jesus story all over creation. That maybe the most powerful moment wasn't the earth shaking, it was the people leaving. To actually go be light in places where people didn't know the light. That they left out of that room and they went. Don't you remember uh, the Mount of Transfiguration where uh, Peter, James, and John are up there with Jesus and all of a sudden like Elijah and Moses appear. And Peter, I love, if you read the Gospels, it's so good because it, it, it gives this kind of like, Peter's the guy that doesn't know how to not talk right? is the image. And so like Jesus and Elijah and Moses and Peter's like, should we build tents? Right? And you're like, come on, buddy. Like just enjoy the moment. Right? But there's this place where we, can we just live here? Can we just set up camp here in this moment? But Jesus doesn't stay on top of the mountain. He comes down the mountain and back into the cities comes down the mountain and up another one on his way to Calvary. And we find in this story that Jesus himself shows us the light is best in dark places. For many of us, we've learned a version of following Jesus where we run from darkness and attempt to hide from any abrasive interactions with people from outside the church. And here's the hard part. Some of us, if we're to be honest, our biggest interaction with people outside the church is on the news. Yeah? The information we've got about our neighbor isn't because we've gotten to know our neighbor. It's because someone from a couple thousand miles away is telling us about our neighbor and we're just believing them. So we end up isolating ourselves from the world and we insulate ourselves in the church. Or here's another one. Some of us get so frustrated at an undermissioned church or believers that our own public witness ends up being people listening to us complain about the believers that we're in Christian fellowship with. I can't believe my church doesn't do more. I can't believe they don't send out more people. I can't believe that they don't. And guess what we're sending out? You who are complaining about how no one's being sent out. You get it? Do you get how this all gets wrapped up? 
Jesus is like, just go be light. That's it. Just go do that. And Satan's like, I got a bowl. You want to use it? And we're like, sure, sounds great, right? And we wonder why the world seems dark. And we wonder why there's news outlets making billions of dollars over just announcing it. Because oftentimes, if your story's like mine, at least my own Don Kaufman sector of the kingdom can oftentimes be under a basket rather than on a lampstand for all to see. The opening line of Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life book is that it's not about you. The light of our new life is not ours to hide or cover. It's about glorifying God in whatever way we can. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 16 says, your light must shine before people. That's it. Your light must shine before people. Some of you, your light shines really good in your prayer moments, which is great. Or when you've got the word open in front of you, which is great. But does it shine before people? What do people see when they see you? What does your public witness look like? When people encounter you, do they see someone who's been redeemed and transformed? Do they see anger that's been turned to grace? Do they see hard-heartedness that's been turned into love? Do they see Christ when they hear you talk and what you talk about? Your light must shine before people, listen, in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Your light must shine before people. Give off your light in the kind of way that causes people to see your good works. Your witness has to present itself as good works. That's how people see your light. This is what we say and do. Every visible and outward expression, or as Paul says in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, In word or in deed, do everything. Notice he didn't give a caveat. There's no asterisk for a bottom list of exceptions. Do everything in the name or the identity or the reputation or the presence of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. Every part of your life, every word you say, every attitude you release, every act you do, do it all under and towards the reputation and the reign of Jesus. Which means we got to take the bowl off. The basket can't be covering. Brendan Manning says this. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyles. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Does that sting a little bit? Is it possible that the darkness in the world all around us is because the light of the world has gotten more comfortable critiquing and cursing the darkness rather than being the light that we're called to be in it? Jonathan Brooks, who's a pastor in the city, wrote a book called Church Forsaken. Jonathan's a guy who grew up in Inglewood, uh, right on Marquette. Uh, went to college uh, at Tuskegee University just trying to get out of the city, as many do. Some of you in this room are witnesses. Went and got a degree in architecture, thinking that'll keep me out of Chicago. Tried to live away from Chicago, uh, and God called him back to Chicago. An opportunity came up in Chicago to move back, so he was working downtown at an architecture firm, living in Bronzeville, uh, but drove to a church in Inglewood because he knew that they needed a little bit of help where he grew up. Some of you have testimonies, so you know how this story goes. The pastor who had fallen ill asked Jonathan if he would be willing to preach. So he said, yeah, yeah, I guess I could fill in. So he did. And then after a while, the pastor was kind of like, I think you should keep preaching. And all of a sudden you realize that sometimes the kingdom will suck you right in, right? Uh, And so, okay, so he did. But then there was that, like, I'm never moving my family back to Inglewood because it took me so long to get myself out. That was my whole life's fight was just to get out. But guess what happened? God called him back in. Ended up pastoring and moving into Inglewood. He called the neighborhood he grew up in Church Forsaken. That's the name of the book. Because he said there's some people that would call it God Forsaken, but God never left. Who left was the church. And the darkness that exists is because the light ran away. And what needs to happen for light return to the darkness is for the light to move back into the neighborhood. We say God forsaken in so many areas, but we know that God hasn't abandoned anyone or any place. It was the church that has. 
He moved back in the neighborhood and pastored there to bring light into a dark place. Church, listen. I don't know if you've paid attention to this, but Illinois and Chicagoland are filled with problems and darkness. But it's also filled with lights that are oftentimes hiding under bowls complaining about it. We equate posting on social media with shining light. We consider complaining to like-minded people as though we're shining our light. How can the lights make any difference to the darkness if the light is constantly isolating itself and justifying its insulation from the world we're called to shine in? Tonight, we're excited about we, a band called Ren Collective. We love them. They're over here at Trinity tonight, and we were trying to catch up, so I kind of am able to follow some of their songs tonight. But they have a new song out called Hallelujah Anyways, and like one of the third lines in the song, I thought it was so good for today, he says, I'd rather strike a match than curse the dark. That's the kind of posture our hearts take when we're not trying to figure out how do we get under a bowl, but we're trying to figure out how do we put our lamp on a, on a lampstand? How, how does the light show up? How does it get out? How do we make sure people can see who Christ is? First Peter chapter 2, 11, he says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war in your soul. Church, don't forget we are foreigners and exiles here. Hold yourself back from sinful desires in you. They wage war in your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, which is really just a church way of saying people who don't believe. That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. Even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they don't have truth to back it up. All they see are your good works and that gives glory to God. Matthew chapter five, verse 16. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. It has to shine before people so that our personal walk shows up in public works and practical works that result in praise and worship. You aren't meant to be seen in any of this. Did you catch that? What he's asking to be seen are the works, not you. Show me where the church is moving. Show me where the church is bringing light. Show me where the church is active. Show me the good works. And those good works bring glory to God. We want people to see the works we were doing. We used to be darkness, but now we're light in the Lord. So now we can point people to glorifying the God who gave us the new life in which we now live. If on the way in, if you grabbed one of these lights, if you didn't, if you could raise a hand, someone will have people bring them around. Everybody got one? Okay, we've got a couple people. If we could... Bring those around. Sometimes I've been out of student ministry for about 14 years, but sometimes it just comes back. Actually, I was talking to Mike and uh, Locke, and, and we've done this in, in uh, Rev before. And sometimes it's just helpful for us to see what's going on. I think we're pretty close. We got a couple more we need over here. If we got some couple up here in this corner, a couple way back in the balcony. We're, we're going to need some. This illustration will not work if the whole room's dark, so we need more lights, all right? <laughs> or if you have your cell phone, I mean, that's another option too. Just use the flashlight on your phone. And if you really want a keychain, we'll get you one on the way out. Don't worry, you won't be slighted, all right? Are we pretty close? All right, if you could just, if you don't have a light, if you could raise your hand or you don't have a cell phone, just raise your hand. If you do have a cell phone, get your flashlight ready. Max, would you bring the lights down? Here's what I want us to see. Okay, you're getting a little giddy. Turn them off. And those weren't the student ministry in the room either. We see you, all right? We live in a world that is experiencing the darkness of this sinful world all over the place. Amen? People will blame the rescuer rather than the reason, and the reason is us. People. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but in our darkness, Jesus' blood covered over our sin and his resurrection. We are new creations and identified as the light of the world. But what I want us to see is this. I want us to see where we can let our light shine in the darkness. And if you can keep your lights off, I'm gonna read through a list. 
You forget, I can see your faces. I know who's doing it, all right? <laughs> the principal's office is going to be a little full this week, friends, all right? Here's what I would love to do. As I, I'm going to read through a list kind of slowly, enough to where we can react. But I'm going to ask, do you know someone struggling with? I'm going to list some things. And if you do, if you know someone struggling with that, if you could just turn your light on. Do you know someone struggling deeply with anxiety? Yep. Okay. Do you know somebody struggling with depression? Are you looking around the room? Do you know somebody struggling with isolation or loneliness? Do you know somebody struggling in their marriage or with a divorce? Do you know somebody who's struggling with some deep identity battles? Do you know somebody struggling with unwanted singleness? Do you know somebody who's suffered at the hands of or maybe currently suffering in the hands of abuse? What about health issues, sickness, disease? What about finance issues? Wondering where the next provision is going to come from. What about insecurities or insufficiencies? If we were to go back to those Wren Collective lyrics, Jesus has already struck a match, and it's you. If you look around the room, even though there's darkness in the things we've mentioned, there is light. In the room without it, if we could bring this room into total darkness, which may scientifically be not true, or we'd have to come back till like 9.30 tonight, right? But if we were, we would see the power of light, because even just this little bit of light allows you to not trip on the stairs. It allows you to navigate. It allows you to see stuff a little bit more clear. When the darkness is filled with light, all of a sudden, darkness doesn't exist, and in Jesus' case, it couldn't overcome him. I want to read a little bit of this end from the book, Cost of Discipleship, to you. Bonhoeffer is talking about the visibility of the cross and its community. He says this, didn't the cross become extraordinarily visible amongst the darkness to the terrified spectators? Jesus has called us to be the light of the world under the foot of the cross. The cross is the strange light which alone illuminates these good works of the disciples. It is by seeing the cross and the community beneath it that people come to believe in God, and that is the light of the resurrection. Church, you are the light of the world. This city on a hill cannot be hidden. Jesus wouldn't let it. But neither does anyone, because it doesn't make any sense, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. But instead, you take it, and as you elevate it, it gives light to the entire house. And by it, you can see. And what we're reminded, as we come to this passage, is that we have an identity and a calling that we've been given in Christ. It doesn't exist without him. Without him, we're just darkness. But in him, we get to be the light of the world. And the way the darkness around us will see him and will see light is oftentimes, if you read through scripture, God uses people like you and me. The question becomes this, will we be the kinds of people who take our light and put it up on a lampstand so that our neighbors can see us and our coworkers can see us and our families can see us and our friends can see it? And that by doing that, we would... We would do good works that they don't look at us, but they look to God because they've seen the kinds of things that God's people do. Would you stand and pray? Lord Jesus, oftentimes it is easy for us to get into a posture where we find the assurance of our salvation 
And we kind of just sit on a waiting bench and learn a bunch of stuff until your return or our ascent home. Father, would be reminded that the gospel isn't just about what's happened in the past, Christ's death, burial, resurrection. It's not just about what's happening in the future with his return, but has very much to do with how all of that informs how we live today. Father, would we be reminded that the old is gone and the new is here, that our old self has been taken off, that through Christ we've been made new, purified, that there's a holiness we get to step into not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ has done for us. So Father, would you, would you keep us from putting a basket over what you're doing in our lives? Would we see and not be fooled by, tricked by, or lied to anything that deters us from just giving more and more to King Jesus? Would all this be true in Jesus' name? Amen.